Okay. So up until now, we've been doing computations, but we always assumed that we just somehow magically knew the reservoir parameters. Right? They were just given to you. But in reality, uh, I mean, we we've, we've mentioned before that the vertical stress is pretty easy to to estimate, but the other two are, is almost no. I mean, there's no way to estimate them. So I mean, you can you can confine them through this kind of concept that the crustal Earth is always in this state of, of continuous uh, frictional faulting, right? And so we talked about how you can sort of confine the principal stresses, but uh, there can be a, you know, that just really gives you a, a maximal or an upper bound. Uh, the lower bound and the, and the distinct differences between the two can be a lot. So uh, one way that we can, uh, it's a pretty reliable way to find S3, and you notice I don't say necessarily that this is a horizontal principal stress because you could possibly be in a scenario where the vertical principal stress is the minimum. And so uh, here we're basically, you can, you can do hydraulic fracturing uh, techniques, tests essentially, to determine the minimum principal stress, which is either uh, the minimum horizontal stress or um, the, the vertical stress. And so uh, we typically, I'm sure you're familiar, at least at a conceptual level, with hydraulic fracturing from a reservoir stimulation technique. And that's sort of how I have the picture drawn here, uh, the cartoon. But in this case, we're talking about what we'll call mini fracks. So these are not, these are not reservoir stimulation techniques uh, as much as they are diagnostic techniques where we're going to intentionally produce hydraulic fractures uh, in order to infer what the principal stress is. Okay, so uh, the reason I did use this cartoon is because it does show the, the kind of standard notion that the hydraulic fractures will propagate away from the wellbore in a direction that's perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress, okay? And, and this is true certainly in conventional reservoirs. This is pretty much standard case, all right? So we're going to sort of limit our discussion to the theoretical or the classical case that this, this is true, okay? What, and the reason I mention that is because if, if you're familiar with shales uh, and shale stimulation techniques, uh, th because of the impermeability uh, of the shale and the fact that they're naturally fractured, the fluid tends to diffuse in a way that sort of activates the natural fractures in the rock and you get uh, much, because it's an easier path, they just sort of open up natural fractures that exist as opposed to propagating new ones. Now, you do propagate new hydraulic fractures as well, but the sort of preferred mechanism is to activate these passive of connected uh, natural fractures in the rock, and then you get a lot more fra fracture complexity. So everything I said there, just an aside, to say that my cartoon here is probably not valid in a shale, okay? But again, we're not trying to use this for stimulation. We're just talking about using it as a diagnostic technique. So if we uh, look at our Kirsch solution, or we go back to our Kirsch solution, um, we computed at least this part, or we showed at least this part of the solution for the minimum tangential stress. So this is uh, the tangential stress is in compression, and here we're interested in the minimum one uh, because that's the one that's close enough, closest to tension, right? And we're going to get a hydraulic fracture whenever we put the wellbore, the hoop stress into tension, okay? So the minimum hoop stress is going to get into tension first, right? And uh, by simplifying the Kirsch equations at the wellbore wall, right? So when we do that, then it reduces to this equation where I've included this temperature term as well, okay? So <clears throat> this will go into tension uh, and create a hydraulic fracture whenever um, whenever T0 is equal to the tensile strength of the rock. Well, I mean, this is all, I mean, for all practical purposes here, this is essentially zero, right? Not to say that rocks can't withstand a little bit of tension, but for the most part, uh, the, you know, zero is a good approximation, so. Uh, <clears throat> the rocks don't don't with, withstand much stress and tension. Okay, so uh, 
so with this equation then we can sort of predict uh, when the fracture will initiate. Now it's it's important to understand that there's a couple things here, right? Remember the Kirsch, Kirsch solution, this will come up later. The, clerk, the Kirsch solution assumes a circular well bore, right? And it's it's intended to understand the stress intensity associated with this circular hole in the middle of a continuous medium, right? So uh, it's not valid when you have breakouts. It's not valid after a fracture initiates, okay? So the Kerr solution is for a circular hole, and it's meant to identify um, <clears throat> the stress intensity associated with that. 